This man's violent rampage spread terror throughout an entire country. He started a three-month killing spree that would send Ukraine into turmoil. He went in and shot them dead. They had no time to react. 52 innocent people were murdered at the hands of this madman. He was an extremely cold, calculating person who'd had problems in his youth. These factors produced an explosive combination. This is my life, and I think it's my destiny. This man's from the devil. He was motivated by evil, and that's, that's what drove him. March 1996. People throughout Ukraine were living in fear. Forty people had been murdered without motive or reason. Police were baffled. They had no suspect, no leads. The unknown killer's hunting grounds were the small villages surrounding the Ukrainian capital of Kiev. In these isolated areas, he could strike without warning and disappear into the night. His brutal methods had earned him the nickname, the Terminator. In the villages, people prepared for each night as if they were under siege. Most people came home from work by 5 or 6 p.m. And everybody waited in their houses in fear. Younger people had temporarily moved back with their parents. They immediately began to reinforce their homes. They put bars in the windows and on the ground floor. We asked the troops to come in. Imagine that. The schools shut down. Soldiers were on patrol day and night with a big radio station broadcasting all the time, like in wartime. The terror was palpable. Villagers knew they were being hunted at random. Their entire family could be wiped out as they slept. The killer was known only by his chilling nickname. Anyone who came face to face with the Terminator was slaughtered. The massacres began on December 24, 1995. Under the cover of darkness, the killer crept into a home. He shot the husband and wife, and then strangled their two young children with his bare hands. He stole what he could carry, and then set their house ablaze to cover his tracks. One week later, another family was exterminated, their home robbed and burned to the ground. The slaughter continued. At each crime scene, there were no witnesses and little evidence. If anyone caught him and as he was leaving, he would shoot them or, or knife them, depending on which was easiest for him. Police were certain there was a single killer behind all the murders. The Ukrainian government launched a sweeping manhunt. They dispatched the National Guard and placed 2,000 police investigators on the case. We had special teams of senior officers working in different capacities. We had officers in the field, around the clock, gathering information and working with operatives. Then there were others in charge of strategy who directed the ground operations. Villagers reported anything suspicious. On April 14th, a frightened resident called police with a tip. The caller said that he had seen a neighbor trying to conceal a shotgun as he left his apartment building. Police began investigating the suspect. It was quite risky because, on the one hand, there was no evidence. But what if it's him? What if it is this trained killer who shoots people dead on the spot and our officers are only human? Police moved forward with extreme caution. The officers arrived in unmarked cars and blocked off exits to the suspect's building. They wanted to make sure there was no way for him to escape. 
they also had to avoid any chance of detection. We learned from their neighbors that our suspect was unsociable. He wouldn't open the door to strangers. It was Easter, and his fiancée went to visit her mother out of town. She had to return in the evening, and we hoped that when we rang, he'd think that it was her coming home. An investigator approached the door and knocked. A small, unassuming man with reddish-brown hair answered the door. He opened the door very calmly. He was expecting his family to be there, and it was the police. Investigators forced their way into the apartment. They asked for his identification papers. In an act of defiance, the red-haired man lunged for a pistol. Police quickly restrained him. Authorities noticed that the pistol was similar to one stolen from a crime scene. They checked the man's credentials. He was 36-year-old Anatoly Anoprienko. They searched the apartment. Its contents were like a map of the killing spree. And in the apartment is everything. All the evidence is there. Things from the crime scenes where he'd murdered people in different regions. Onoprienko proclaimed his innocence. He insisted the suspicious items belonged to a friend. Soon his fiancée, Anna, returned home. She maintained he was the kindest, most gentle partner she'd ever had and the most loving stepfather to her two children. But as she continued talking with police, she couldn't deny the evidence that was mounting against Onoprienko. I started talking with his fiancée. And I tried to find ways of connecting him with these murders. We were able to match dates. She would give us a date when he wasn't home for a day or two, and that date would correspond with the murders. Officers escorted Onoprienko to police headquarters, while investigators continued searching the apartment. By the end of the day, 122 articles belonging to the murder victims were recovered. Police also discovered the same kind of weapon used in the killings. Officers began interrogating their suspect. Was this the person responsible for slaughtering 40 people in three months? The same person who had terrified thousands? Soon, Anatoly Onoprienko would reveal his horrifying secrets. Yavoriv, Ukraine, 1996. After a three-month manhunt, police believed they had finally captured a serial killer known as the Terminator. His name was Anatoly Onoprienko. Onoprienko's apartment was littered with evidence, but if police hoped to put the Terminator behind bars for good, they needed a confession. For me, it was crucial to make certain that it was him to make sure that he can be tied to these killings. Investigators launched a grueling interrogation. Finally, Onoprienko cracked. His mind was a maze of horrors. He described his twisted thoughts in a taped confession. I was observing the victims, those who were already killed how they were dying or just how they were living the last minutes of their lives. He told us about all 52 murders he'd committed. Not only the ones he'd performed in 1995, but also about the murders he'd committed in the past a long time ago. When he was caught, he said it came as a relief. He said he was fed up with his dirty business. He was fed up of being covered in blood the whole time. He wants an end to it. The local police handed Onoprienko over to the Ukrainian Interior Ministry, the top law enforcement office in the country. 
он сказал, что не будет. He said he wouldn't say anything and immediately started making demands. At that time, he gave me the impression that he was extremely greedy, calculating and cold. The ministry wanted to question the suspect for themselves, but Onoprienko had a different idea. When we came, he said at once, I need a kilo of sweets, some sausage and crackers, otherwise I won't talk to you. It took months of bizarre negotiations and interrogations, but Onoprienko finally agreed to walk authorities through each of his murders. On June 28, 1997, police drove Onoprienko back to the villages he had terrorized. He described the killings with eerie calmness. He would talk to about it as if he was reading from a menu. He said it was incredibly easy. Afterward, a panel of psychiatrists interviewed him. I hear voices, and I talk to those voices. Right now, I'm receiving some information about all of you. I'm a person, a regular person. Anybody can become a murderer. I was helped. Either it was a god or the devil, whatever he calls himself. After 28 hours of questioning, psychiatrists determined that Anatoly Onoprienko was in control of his actions and knew the difference between right and wrong. They declared he was competent to stand trial. His stories of Satan and mysterious voices they believed were part of a twisted play for attention. What authorities could not yet explain was how this quiet and frail-looking man became a monster. I am an angel who was attending a school of Satan. Some will call me schizophrenic or even Hitler or other terrible things, but that's okay with me. Anatoly Onoprienko was born in the town of Lasky in northern Ukraine in July 1959, while the country was still under Soviet control. His mother died when he was four years old. He and his older brother grew up with an abusive and alcoholic father. I remember my father and brother staring at me and saying, let's send him to an orphanage. I don't blame them, but I am horrified by their memory. I remember their voices. At his father's insistence, his grandmother took him to the orphanage in Malin. It is not clear why Anatoly was sent away while his brother remained with the family. His grandmother stayed with him at the orphanage for the first few days to help him adjust. Afterwards, she visited frequently and brought care packages of food. Despite his rough beginning, Anatoly adjusted to his new life. He was shy but managed to make friends. At the age of 14, he enrolled at the Malin College of Forestry. He took an interest in sports, but his passion for education began to slip. A few years later, his teachers became concerned about Anatoly's destructive behavior. He was drinking vodka, smoking, and stealing. Onoprienko left school in 1976 at the age of 17, hoping to find his calling. He joined the army where he received firearms training. But instead of finding his purpose, Onoprienko felt ostracized. When I was 20, I called myself stupid because I couldn't understand people. If they were smart, then I must be stupid. After he was discharged, Onoprienko got a job on a cruise ship in the harbor of Odessa. He became adept at stealing money from cabins. 
He wanted to impress a string of casual girlfriends with trinkets and gifts. And on the face of it, he was stealing because he wanted to rob, and he was motivated by that. A young waitress caught his attention. The two quickly began a relationship, and after three years together, she became pregnant. Anatoly left his life on the ship to be with his new family, but the young father was restless. He soon left his girlfriend and newborn child and never tried to contact them again. He believed he had a unique destiny, and he felt compelled to find it on his own. Soon, murder would become his passion. For most of his childhood in Ukraine, Anatoly Onoprienko had felt abandoned and ostracized. Now on his own, he was determined to find a purpose to his life. To pursue his mission, he abandoned his girlfriend and young child and returned to a life of crime. During most of the 1980s, Onoprienko searched for his calling and he used stolen goods to bankroll his quest. Tough economic times in the region made it easier for Onoprienko to elude police. Onoprienko's criminal activity increased in 1989 at the peak of perestroika when the USSR was collapsing and no one was responsible for anything. It was around this time that Onoprienko transformed from petty thief to murderer. He broke into his landlady's apartment hoping to steal a few valuables but she walked in on him before he could finish the job. He panicked. Without thinking, he killed her and fled. He was never suspected in the murder. Onoprienko and his friend, Sergei Rogozin, robbed several houses together. They were driving home from a trip to Russia when they spotted a car pulling a trailer. Onoprienko swerved in front of the vehicle, grabbed a rifle, and jumped out of his car. Rogozin assumed they would rob the couple and then leave. He was wrong. Onoprienko ordered the driver to roll down his window and without warning, shot both the driver and his wife. He buried the bodies and then set fire to the car. Onoprienko threatened to kill Rogozin's family if he didn't keep quiet about the crime. Rogozin agreed. Onoprienko was eager to kill again. For most of his life, he had felt like an outsider. Now, he discovered that killing made him feel important and powerful. Just over a month later, Onoprienko struck again, killing another couple in their car while Rogozin looked on. In late 1989, Onoprienko ambushed another unsuspecting vehicle. This time, there was a child in the car with his parents. Onoprienko didn't hesitate. He killed everyone inside, including the sleeping 11-year-old boy. He dragged the bodies into a ditch, poured gasoline over them, and set them ablaze. Then the murders suddenly stopped. For the next six years, Onoprienko traveled throughout Europe. His urge to kill seemed to have disappeared. He worked in Germany and Austria. During our interrogation, we asked him if he had killed anyone there, and he denied it and said he had only committed a robbery. At the very beginning, I had an option to commit suicide and to stop this mission to kill. But then, with the passage of time, there was an order from above that I cannot kill myself. I am supposed to live and keep doing what I am doing and finish this game. In 1995, Onoprienko decided to return home to Ukraine and continue his killing spree. He assumed that while he was away, his previous murders would have become legend in Eastern Europe. By this point, the Soviet Union had collapsed and Ukraine had become independent. As a result, law enforcement under the new government was in disarray. Police had never connected Onoprienko's roadside killings to a single gunman and weren't actively investigating the crimes. 
когда на приемку убедился в том, что When he came back and realized that everything had been forgotten and no one was looking for him, he embarked on his second killing spree. Onoprienko moved from town to town while he plotted his next step. He traveled to a relative's house. He knew he'd find what he needed inside. His relatives, who were hunters, had come back from a hunt, left this gun and went off to cook the fresh meat. He broke the door and stole some things, including the gun. He cut off the barrel of the gun to increase its destructive power. This time, he wanted people to remember his crimes. In the winter of 1995, armed with his new gun, Anatoly Onoprienko traveled to Odessa. He broke into the home of a 70-year-old woman, shot her, and set fire to the house. My main purpose wasn't to rob. My purpose was cruel. I can't explain it. My purpose was to threaten people and threaten the police and lead them in the wrong direction. Four days later, Onoprienko arrived in the town of Malin, where his rampage continued. He shot a man and a woman who were having sex in their car. I shot at them from the driver's side and wounded the man. Then the woman jumped out of the car. I waited until she put her clothes on. Then she ran off, probably to get some help. When the woman returned, he shot her. Onoprienko then finished the driver off with a knife. He put the woman back into the car, drove the vehicle to a secluded area, and set it ablaze. He took the couple's money and fled the scene. Onoprienko disappeared into the night. A month later, he struck again. In time, his attacks took on a distinctive pattern. He would literally find a house. He would create a noise outside, uh, maybe throwing a stone at a window. The man would come outside, he would shoot him. He would go inside, um, he would go from room to room, hunting the women who would kill first, then he would go through and kill the children. Anatoly Onoprienko had begun one of the worst killing sprees in European history. No one in his path was safe. In 1995, Anatoly Onoprienko was on a mission to become Ukraine's most prolific serial killer. I started realizing that there was a plan for me. Something was giving me direction. He stalked his victims at night, but during the day, he appeared to be a soft-spoken man who was down on his luck. After moving about the country, Onoprienko settled in the village of Yavoriv to live with his cousin Pyotr and Pyotr's wife, Yelena. Ukrainians are very um, uh, family orientated and it would be Pyotr's job to look after his cousin. At the time, he was happy to do it. It was only when Pyotr's wife, Lena, began to be suspicious of Onoprienko. She was slightly suspicious of the, the rifle that he kept under his bed. Yelena urged her husband to tell Anatoly to leave. But Pyotr felt guilty about turning his cousin out onto the streets. Instead, he decided to pawn Onoprienko off on a lovelorn young woman. Anna Kazak was a hairdresser who lived nearby. She was a divorced mother of two struggling to bring up her children. Pyotr thought the two would get along well. He also knew that Anna had a spare room. Her husband, who was an abusive alcoholic, had left her, and she was looking for a love affair and um, a meal ticket. Pyotr introduced them at a family party, and they hit it off immediately. Anatoly moved in within weeks and assumed the role of a loving family man. He told Anna that he was a traveling businessman. She suspected nothing when he left for days at a time. Not long after their first meeting, Onoprienko traveled to Malin. In Ukraine, families live in, in big uh, in houses or farms. They live together as grandparents, two or three generations, and children 
altogether. Now, the, the winter of 1995 was one of the coldest in Ukraine's history. It was minus 40, there were lots of blackouts, there was lots of periods of time without electricity. Onoplenko used that to his advantage. The combination of large families living in blackout conditions meant that he could ambush a greater number of victims at one location. And in these remote villages, he was able to attack and then flee without being seen. On Christmas Eve 1995, Nikolai Zachenko and his family were sleeping soundly in their home. Onoprienko approached the dark house and used a ladder to peer through a window. He fired through the glass, killing Zychenko and his three-year-old son who was sleeping beside him. Onoprienko then crawled through the window and advanced from room to room. Zychenko's wife pleaded with him, but Onoprienko showed no mercy. He stabbed her and then strangled their second child, a three-month-old baby. Onoprienko torched the house to cover his tracks. When we arrived at the site, we discovered that the whole family had died violently. At the time, we didn't know the reason for the crime. We developed leads, examined a number of options. We considered burglary the main motive then. We thought it was homicide for purpose of robbery. Seven days later, on New Year's Eve, Onoprienko struck again. He told Anna that he had to go away on business and left for the village of Bratkovici. He wandered the deserted streets until he came across a local forester. He cursed at me when I asked for money. I asked for some money a second time. He swore at me again. I shot him in the back near the heart. I pulled him to the side of the road. I searched him, took his money, keys, and took off his clothes. His night's work had just begun. Soon after, he noticed a man hanging curtains in his new home. Onoprienko fired at the man through the window, killing him instantly. After making his way into the house, Onoprienko killed the man's wife and her twin sisters. He then cut off the wife's finger to remove her wedding ring. He said cutting through her finger to take off a ring was like cutting through a small branch. It was very easy. Cutting through flesh was like cutting through butter. Onoprienko calmly boarded a train and returned home to Anna and her children. Later that night, he proposed to Anna, giving her the ring that he had chopped off the dead woman's finger just hours earlier. Over 200 miles away, at police headquarters in Kiev, officers scrambled to launch the second mass murder investigation within two weeks. After the second murder, we became convinced that the killer was a maniac. We came to the location and viewed the scene. We saw the brutality of the crime, and it had become absolutely clear to us that it was the same man who committed all the killings. The unstable political environment in the region hampered police efforts. Ukrainian officials pressured investigators to conceal the fact that a potential serial killer was on the loose. During the Soviet era, the government had refused to admit that serial killers existed. And even though Ukraine was now an independent country, authorities still followed the old example. You've got to understand that for the police and for the political and criminal situation in the country at that time, it was unacceptable to admit that this was happening. As the investigation continued, police knew they were up against a serial killer. Each massacre had distinct similarities. It was striking how systematic the murders were. There were group killings. 
убийств. Whole families were wiped out for no visible reason. That was really astounding. Anna Prienko continued to slaughter innocent victims. He is a degenerate who didn't even benefit materially from his crimes, nor did he win any glory. He is an immoral man who was killing defenseless people and children. He was bloodthirsty and greedy. For investigators, catching this ruthless criminal became a desperate race against time. Each sunset meant the killer would have the chance to strike again. In 1995, people in western Ukraine were terrified. Families were being murdered at random by a madman. No one knew when he would strike next. The killer was Anatoly Onoprienko, and he made the rural villages in his homeland his hunting ground. He stalked his victims in the dead of night, knowing there was little chance of being seen or heard. What was typical for all the crime scenes was that they were all around newly built houses that were out of the way. It always happened at night, and every time the same type of gun was fired. Onoprienko took mementos from each of his murder victims. Stolen shoes, clothing, even an old tape deck became gifts for his fiancée and her two children. The presents helped him maintain the facade that he was a loving family man. His fiancée never suspected that this timid-looking man was the serial killer authorities were searching for. Police continued to roam the streets at night looking for a deranged killer. All the police departments had been given instructions as to what to look for. They knew how the killer behaved, that he acted at night. They investigated any sound, even when a dog barked at night. The orders were strict. Rumors about the killing spread through the villages, and investigators could no longer conceal the chilling details from the public. The gruesome facts hit the papers. The media described the crimes as though they had been committed by a killing machine and called the faceless murderer the Terminator. They warned families that a madman was on the loose and to use caution after dark. The slaughter continued. In January 1996, 18 people died at the hands of the Terminator. Another nine followed in February. The victims included Galina and Sergei Bondarchuk and their two children, nine-year-old Valera and seven-year-old Tanya. It wasn't too late, even. They hadn't gone to bed yet. They had just come home shortly before that. They were still dressed. The kids were asleep, and they were still doing things in the house. When they finished, they locked up, they turned the lights off, and about half an hour later, they heard the window on the ground floor shatter. Sergei Bondarchuk kept an axe at the ready. He grabbed the weapon and raced outside. Hidden in the darkness, Anna Priyanka was waiting to pull the trigger of his sawed-off shotgun. After his capture, Anna Priyanka used a dummy to demonstrate how he committed each of the murders. <laughs> Onoprienko dragged Sergei's body away and waited for his wife, Galina, to come out to see what had happened. When she finally ventured outside, Onoprienko met her at the door. He pushed her inside. She turned away from him, and he killed her with one shot. Her death was the most gentle one. She fell down, and he started searching the house. Onoprienko found the children asleep upstairs. He killed them both, first Tanya, then Valera. We changed the room around. 
There used to be a fold-out armchair here. Tanya slept on it. That was Valera's bed. There was blood on the walls, blood on the walls here. We've changed the wallpaper. He started walking around, rummaging through the house. But there was nothing. Only a tiny, thin gold chain on Galia's neck. It was Sergei's wedding present and earrings. There was no money in the house. They lived from hand to mouth. This time, Onoprienko did not set fire to the house. Instead, he traveled back to his new family, stolen gifts in hand. The body count had reached 38, and police could no longer keep panic from spreading throughout the villages. Investigators continued to hunt for clues at each new crime scene, but their work was becoming increasingly difficult. He'd always set the houses on fire. People saw the fire and came to fight it. There was no evidence left, only holes in the walls and cartridges. Eventually, police determined that the holes were made by shots from a hunting weapon, and only a certain type of gun could make those markings, a sawed-off shotgun. Authorities combed the surrounding villages searching for a match. Then, in April 1996, a concerned villager in Yavariv told police about a man he'd seen with a sawed-off shotgun hidden in his bag. Police responded quickly. A group of 12 officers surrounded Onoprienko's apartment and moved in cautiously. They did not know if their suspect would try to flee or turn violent. Onoprienko put up a brief struggle, but officers were able to subdue him. Once authorities had him in custody, Onoprienko described how he shot, stabbed, and strangled his victims. He also described his lonely childhood in an orphanage. According to Onoprienko, he murdered children so they wouldn't spend their lives without a family. He said, I was an orphan myself, and since I had killed their parents, I decided that I should kill them instead of making them orphans. Experts suspected that Onoprienko lashed out at families as a way to seek revenge on his own parents for abandoning him. As the interrogations continued, Onoprienko confessed to murdering 40 people, including 10 children, in three months. He also admitted to killing 12 people in 1989. The reason he gave for his crimes was shocking. I feel like a cross between a human and a robot. Most of my work was supposed to be done by robots. I consider myself an experimenter with myself and with other people. Finally, criminal psychiatrists agreed that Anatoly Anoprienko was fully competent and could stand trial. Onoprienko and his attorney had 99 volumes of evidence to review. I said, Anatoly, the trial is in two weeks' time, and there's a lot of serious work to do. Let's get to the point. I'm interested in one main thing. Have you really committed all the crimes you were charged with? Was any information added by investigators? He put up his hands and said, Ruslan, these hands are all covered with blood. All these crimes are mine. In 1996, after a nationwide manhunt, Ukrainian authorities finally captured the serial killer who had terrorized their country. Anatoly Onoprienko had murdered 52 innocent people. The trial began on November 23, 1998, in the town of Zhytomyr, which had jurisdiction over several of the crime scenes. Family members of the victims flooded the courthouse waiting to confront the man who had massacred their loved ones. 
не, не было такого суда, а расстреливать на месте таких людей. Each day he was escorted into the courtroom by 15 police officers and locked in a steel cage. The bars kept him from escaping, but they also separated him from the victims' families. When we were on our way to the courthouse, I can only speak for myself, but I felt like I would be able to tell him everything to his face, through the bars. Even if I was far away, he would hear. And when I entered, there was this sense of not fear. I can't even explain. It wasn't fright. It was horror. Most of the villagers had never seen nor heard Onoprienko before. Once they listened to him speak, the families understood why the media called him the Terminator. They're planning to punish me, but whether they shoot me or not, they will always remember me. Although psychiatrists had determined that he was sane, Anna Prienko's behavior in court was bizarre. At one point, he said that he was a beast of Satan and was misunderstood by others. Prosecutors argued that he was only trying to manipulate the courtroom. He believed that the stronger the impression he managed to make on the public and on the courtroom, the better it would be for him because he would be seen as an insane person. He wanted fame or notoriety. And when he saw a large audience, when the hall was overcrowded with people and journalists and full of TV cameras, he was really enjoying himself while he was giving his testimony. Also on trial was Anna Prienko's old friend, Sergei Rogozin. Rogozin joined Anna Prienko in the cage as attorneys outlined the nine murders he witnessed in 1989. Rogozin claimed he did not take part in any of the murders. Anna Prienko backed up his testimony. He could not afford to make an enemy out of Rogozin. Anna Prienko knew that if he ever got out of prison, he would need friends on the outside to help him. This is why he never pointed to Rogozin and made every possible effort to make the court believe that Rogozin wasn't complicit at all. Rogozin was convicted as an accessory in the first nine murders and sentenced to 13 years in prison. Onoprienko's trial for the remaining 43 murders continued. On March 31, 1999, the judge found Anatoly Onoprienko guilty of 52 murders over a six-year period. It took the judge almost two days to read the long and comprehensive verdict. The following day, he was sentenced to death. But because of changing laws in Ukraine, Onoprienko would not be executed. At that time, there was an unwritten moratorium on the death penalty in Ukraine, and death sentences were not carried out. People across the country were outraged. They demanded the Terminator die for his crimes. Members of parliament urged the president to proceed with the execution. Ukraine's decision to join the Council of Europe ultimately saved Onoprienko's life. The council helps Eastern European countries that are trying to establish their independence. It also forbids capital punishment. And as a result, Onoprienko's sentence was commuted to life in prison. He will now be eligible for parole after serving 20 years. While parole is unlikely, many Ukrainians are outraged that there is even a small chance that Anatoly Onoprienko will ever walk the streets again. And what do you think he'll do? He'll keep killing people. He also boasted he always wanted to kill 360 people, and this was his intention. And if he gets out of prison, or when he gets out of prison, this is what he wants to do. I asked him, what are you going to do in prison? He said, I'll escape and be more careful next time. Some 
Today, Anatoly Onoprienko sits in a small cell in Zhitomyr. He claims that prison will not hold him for long, and his desire to kill again continues to terrify his countrymen. From behind bars, he told a reporter, there is no doubt that I will escape from this jail. And when I do, the killing will be much worse. Especially for people who insulted me. I always said I would kill 360, give or take 10. 